I started uh, photographing for my local newspaper, a uh, 4,500 a week weekly newspaper back in Maynard, Massachusetts in 1975. And uh, I've progressed now, so I shoot for my local newspaper, a weekly of about 4,500 circulation out of Bradford, Vermont. Um, in between, there were some more highlights, but uh, I was a technical guy in photography, mostly. Um, I ran photo labs. The only one you might recognize is an outfit called NASA. I used to run their photographic section at Langley Research Center. Uh, discovered that I'm not cut out for working with the government. <laughs> at the time that I left, I thought that might be a bad career move, but I get two reactions. People that can't believe I gave up a good job like that, and other people that said, how do you last for five years? Exactly. And the guys that ask why, how I managed to make it five years are the ones that are interesting to work with. Um, but yeah, so I've done, on, done a lot of technical work. So the trains have been a hobby. When I started in the 1970s. Uh, I photographed both steam and diesel. Uh, I grew up down in Acton, Massachusetts on the Boston and Maine. And uh, I wasted a lot of my, uh, my teen years in high school when I wasn't in the yard out in Air, Massachusetts, and hanging out watching the freight trains. But, uh, we're going to look at steam engines today. There's something like 210 working steam engines, not counting a bunch in Disneyland and Stone Mountain and whatnot. Um, I believe I've got 136 of them fired up and pushing or pulling something. That's the only way I count them for my list. They don't count if they're cold. But, um, so, so far I've traveled to something like 42 states, four provinces, and gone as far as Inner Mongolia looking for steam engines. Uh, we're going to stick to the U.S. Some of these uh, images will be uh, uh, have, were shot on film and scanned, and the more recent ones, of course, are digital. But we're going to go from coast to coast. Um, uh, we're going to have to jump jump around pretty quickly to cover the whole country. But we will stop and take a longer look at three railroads. Uh, two that shut down after World War II, uh, more or less intact. <coughs> and then uh, there's an ambitious group of guys in Maine busily putting back a two-foot line, two-foot gauge line. But uh, before we get into looking at the locomotives, let's take a minute and... Uh, talk about how locomotives get their name and a real quick layman's explanation of what the different sorts of locomotives were designed to do. Okay, so here we're out in Nevada here, but we're jumping on. Uh, for my photography, I want to create realistic scenes that could have been, and I want to avoid <laughs> modern artifacts. Cell phone towers these days are a major nuisance. So we try to keep modern cars. Um, on one shoot, it was actually uh, five years ago today, I noticed in my, uh, looking at my notes. Before the windmills. Yeah, yeah. I haven't run into windmills on steam yet, but soon, yeah. A lot of places I show up on diesel lines. But, um, five years ago today, I was in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and we went so far as to haul down the 50-star flag to put up the proper 48-star flag for our shoot. Um, so the engines have to be fired up and pushing or pulling something to account for the project. And then I'm a photographer. I'm trying to make pretty images. You guys get to decide whether I succeeded. Here we are. We're out in eastern Oregon. This is, this is uh, out by McEwen, Oregon. Most of what you're looking at is steam. These burn wood, so it's spitting off like a giant wood stove. But most of that is steam coming out. Um, and this, is a, this was on the easy end for photography. Uh, we get groups of photographers together. We'll talk more about that in a second. Um, so I'm just standing by the track side, hand-holding my camera. Very little planning. I know the train's coming. I see the train. I take the picture. Some of them are more complicated. This is uh, taken about 2.30 in the morning. This required about 30 studio lights. We were far enough out from any electric source, so we had to bring in three generators. And the reason we didn't shoot until 2.30 in the morning is there was a giant office building in the background. We'd planned far enough ahead to go over and talk to the owners and said, hey, can you turn off the lights when you go home? They said, yeah, but we've got a second shift. We said, we can stay up. So it wasn't until very late that uh, when they got around to... And this is still in Oregon? 
This is, yeah, this is in the, uh, the Brooklyn Roundhouse down in uh, Portland, Oregon, the, the Oregon Rail Heritage Center. But uh, uh, here's a shot. This is five years ago tomorrow. I get a kick out of this shot. Hey, when I show this one, people look at it, and the most common question I get, how did you find the ladies? Okay, ladies are relatively easy to find. Um, <laughs> Steam locomotives are a little more difficult. Two steam locomotives together are very difficult. Um, yeah, we brought in reenactors. Uh, we go and act to the local community theater, or there are, there's a whole hobby of reenacting where people want to do living history, and we uh, we make deals with them, and uh, you know we pay their freight and they show up and uh, we swap photos with them. But, uh, let's take a look at how locomotives get categorized. The real simple explanation of what the uh, how to tell what a locomotive does is little wheels are for starting and working heavy loads. It's something you do in a yard or switching in an industrial park. <coughs> Big tall wheels, driving wheels, are for relatively light trains, passenger trains on relatively level track. And then everything in between is some combination to move lighter or heavier trains either on flat track or up and down, but they all have three different types of wheels. They've got small wheels up front, the leading wheels, and these support the smoke box, the front of the locomotive, and they also help pull the locomotive into a turn. The driving wheels are on a rigid frame, so if they were to hit a turn without being guided a little bit, it would be pretty hard on the rails and the leading wheels. So then the the driving wheels are the interesting ones with all the rods and gears and gizmos. And then trailing wheels are underneath the cab. These support the firebox and I'll let you get up. So you can see we've got two little wheels, one axle, two wheels. So this is a two. Then we've got four axles of driving wheels. So it's a two eight. And then there are two wheels underneath the cab. So this is a two eight two. Uh, the various wheel arrangements had different names, some of them more or less universal across all, every railroad. This is a Mikado, and pretty much everybody that ran them called them Mikados. Okay. Its bigger brother would be a 484, uh, four leading wheels, four, you know, four driving axles, and four trailing. Okay. And that was called a Berkshire on the Boston and Albany. Most places called it a Northern. But imagine being the locomotive salesman calling on the Southern Railway trying to sell them something called a Northern. So, <laughs> so yeah, uh, the Southern Railroads all had their own names for them. Uh, there were some combinations. This engine's got two sets of driving wheels. We've got four leading wheels up front, then six driving wheels, six more driving wheels, and four wheels holding up the firebox. Okay, steam has a lot of energy even after it's been through the cylinder once. So this is effectively two steam locomotives under one boiler uh, reusing the steam. Okay. This was built by the Union Pacific for their fast passenger trains. Uh, and this was called a Challenger. There was a fellow called White. He's British, so we can't spell White. Um, he, he was the one that came up with the system of designating the... Uh, by the wheel arrangement, some common wheel arrangements. Up in, uh, particularly in northern logging railroads, two-foot railroads, uh, standard gauge, gauge is the distance between the rails, standard gauge is eight feet, excuse me, four feet, eight and a half inches. Okay, and... How did they come up with that? Do you know? It, there, there are all sorts of theories. It goes back, the most popular one you'll hear is it goes back to the Roman chariot. Roman chariots, yeah. And why they came up with four feet eight and a half inches is lost to history. But um, smaller, you could make a, but when railroads started, they were all, the, nobody was thinking of an interconnected system. The uh, railroad from White River Junction to Woodstock was to go from White River Junction to Woodstock. Okay, it didn't occur to anybody that you might want to go from Woodstock to Springfield, Mass. Um, so railroads built what they thought was best for where they were running, and it was only after they got a lot, they started building that somebody said, hey, you know, 
if we all had the same size equipment, we could start swapping it back and forth and getting along. Um, but uh, the advantage of the smaller gauges are you can get into tighter spaces and it's cheaper to build. It's, there's a lot less material involved, a lot smaller right away. The bridges are much smaller. Uh, so the woods of northern New England and up through Quebec were filled with little two-foot gauge railroads, uh, which is a long-winded way of saying this. Uh, no leading wheels, two sets of two, two driven axles, and then no trailing wheels. That was pretty common uh, for the little logging railroads. Um, two six O's were freight, uh, freight engines for smaller branch lines with smaller rail that couldn't take something very heavy. Two eight O's were a bigger cousin for the freight. You know, little heavier rail, bigger branch lines, a little more weight behind them. 282 is a very common freight engine. Uh, you know, then you get to uh, some of the real big monsters. Uh, the Union Pacific, back in World War II, back in this era, the uh, axles under the cars did not have bearings. They rode on a little piece of brass. And you put a lot of grease on them, but there was a lot of friction. They didn't roll anywhere near as easily as they did now. Um, but the Union Pacific came up with the idea that they wanted an engine that would carry, would pull a hundred cars at a hundred miles an hour across the plains. Then they came up with, you may have seen the big boy in the news over the last few years. This was a 4884, a big monster, uh, big brother of the Union Pacific engine we saw a minute ago. Uh, these were all farmed out as display pieces after the war and I think it's four or five years back now, Union Pacific decided they were going to go buy one back from one of the museums and restore it. It's been touring the country. and It pops up in the news when it runs. But Did they really do 100 miles an hour? They tried. Uh, like a <laughs> well, the, uh, the New York Central used to uh, schedule stuff at 90 miles an hour across the water level route in uh, upstate New York. Um, these, these things were capable of moving right along. Here's how we get the pictures. We, uh, oops, I skipped one. This is on the East Broadtop Railroad that our rail fans will recognize. Right, right in the way. Okay, is that dinner? Hank, we're paying the railroad to run the trains. These are all museum pieces, and if they run regularly, they, they haul tourists. And apparently, this seems odd to me, but apparently tourists don't like getting up a couple hours before dawn to go see the train. I, I, yeah, so they, uh, so when we want to photograph them, the good light's obviously dawn and dusk. So we pay the railroad to run it, and then it's expensive. So we get a group of photographers together, and we even put up with videographers. I have to be polite about videographers because we've got one in the back of the room. But <laughs> yeah, um, a big steam locomotive is an expensive thing to run. So. Uh, it takes a lot of us to get the cost manageable. This is on the Reading and Northern. I think that locomotive cost us $16,000 for the day. So there's a pile of us to make it affordable. Well, let's take, let's start looking at some of the engines. We're starting up in the Pacific Northwest. Um, we got Portland is, uh, the Oregon Rail Heritage Center is pointing at Portland. Oregon. I, I was very confused the first time I had gone to Portland, Oregon. It was only 12, 14 years ago that I got up there the first time. Of course, you can't go east from Portland. You know, everybody knows that. It's the Atlantic Ocean. So I was constantly confused by all the signs pointing east out of, out of Portland. But there are lots of uh, railways up here. We're going to start literally on the west coast. This is the Oregon Scenic Railroad. And just down the embankment behind him, is the Pacific Ocean. We're out at uh, the morning. This is a little 262, little freight engine. This was a this was logging country as well as some dairy. They had a logging train. We do our best to recreate the trains that they would have hauled. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, this is the same engine. Uh, the last shot would have been just about here. 
But this is the Pacific Ocean coming along. A little further up the line, there's a pretty famous bridge. This one, uh, the first time we shot out here, we arrived at low tide, and a bunch of folks waded out to these islands. And we waited too long, and there were a lot of really wet guys getting back on the train. <laughs> this is the same locomotive we saw at night. This is in the Oregon Rail Heritage Center. What do you shoot for camera at this moment? Yeah, these days I'm shooting with cannons. Um, I'm the wrong guy to ask about gear. If they ever make a good one, I'll remember it. But, yeah. but uh, yeah, the lenses these days are phenomenal. When I started, everybody was designing lenses with a slide rule and cutting them by hand. So lenses are phenomenal, but cameras are interchangeable. And, it's, um, and that's, that's another point to make. All these steam locomotives were designed by guys with slide rules. No calculators. And, it's, uh, and all cut by skilled, skilled technicians. But uh, These guys have a couple of steam locomotives and know where to run them. Uh, they've got about two-thirds of a mile of track before they connect to the Burlington Northern Santa Fe main line. And the Columbia River Gorge has been backed up for freight for 20 years now. They've got more traffic than they can handle with their track. And the last thing the railroad needs is another headache out there. Um, so these guys put on a pretty good show with the two-thirds of a mile of track they had. Um, this is another shot after the... Uh, and of course, the guys that restore these things put thousands of hours into rebuilding them. And so when they get a chance to run them, they show up. Um, and these are the two guys that were the uh, masterminds of restoring this engine. And we had to make them pose. And we're up in the, the Chalahatchee Railroad out of Yakult, Washington. If that makes it yet. Yakult, Y A C L T. The. Uh, I, this one actually wasn't even on my list. Um, there's a fellow that runs charters now, and he does a wonderful, he's a phenomenal photographer. He does a lot of legwork, a fellow named Pete Laro, who's outside of Philadelphia. But he'll go out and arrange with the railroads, and uh, he does a lot of planning. He'll go out and make sure we have places to stand and cut brush if we needs to. Um, and so when Pete said he was going to run a charter on this, I said, okay, take my money. And this is about as sunny as it got all day. But uh, another shot. Of course, if there's a tunnel on the line, we have to get a picture of the engine coming out of the tunnel. Uh, can't pass that up. But uh, how many of you have ever seen a picture of a train coming into a tunnel? You want to make sure you're in very good terms with the engineer before you stand <laughs> on the tracks in the tunnel. Or you're really skinny. Yeah, well, I, uh, <laughs> but the, we have... Management, railroad management with a, with a ray. I shouldn't be saying, you're retired, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah okay, we got an FRA guy. <laughs> this probably isn't allowed. <laughs> um, it's, not, it's not encouraged. Yeah. We, we've got a railroad manager with a radio talking to the engineer. And the engineer actually, before we get in there, they'll come in and they'll make a couple of runs to make sure they know exactly how long it's going to take them to stop. And then that we set up. Um, this is a little bit of a telephoto line, so there is some gap, but yeah, you want to make sure you're in good terms. You promise the crew a very good dinner after the shoot. <laughs> yeah. Hey, and then the, the next day we went down to the Mount Rainier Scenic Railroad. I was really excited. You know, beautiful shots of Mount Rainier in the background. Uh, yep. Look at that view of Mount Rainier. <laughs> Yeah, I know. I, uh, and it seems that every time I fly out there, the pilot goes and gives us beautiful views of Mount Rainier and or Mount Hood, and then as soon as I land, they just disappear. So, you know, they may just be painted on the top of the clouds for all I know. Um, oops, 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 we're going the wrong way. This is a little different sort of engine. Notice there's a big hump over the boiler. This engine doesn't have a tender. It's carrying its water in a tank over top of the boiler. This makes it shorter so it fits in smaller places and it also has the advantage that the more water you put in 
more the engine weighs and the harder it presses down on the rail and it's a pull just a little more. Uh, this was common for logging and industrial uses. Um, oops, I can't use my button here. Okay, there's the same engine from the side. You can see they've just got a little bunker for wood on the, the back end. He was out creeping around for us. This is a little different sort of locomotive. There were four or five designs, three popular, of geared locomotives. Instead of having pistons that push parallel with the rail, these had pistons that either stood up or were canted, and the wheels were connected to a drive shaft. A, one of the problems with steam locomotives is that they're very, very powerful, but they apply the power poorly to the rail. They push on one side, and then there's a pause, very, very brief, before they push on the other side. But the, you know, gravity works at very quick, so the, the, they're pushing alternately so they never get the wheels turning together. Uh, with the geared locomotives, the pistons are connected to a drive shaft, and they always have tension on a drive shaft with, that's geared to drive the wheels, like the old, uh, you know, the, uh, the rear end joints on an old car. Um, this is a, it was a very effective design for what it was made for. They aren't very fast. Uh, the top speed on the very fastest of these would have been 11 or 12 miles an hour downhill with a good tailwind. Uh, their purpose was to climb. They could carry their weight, and twice their weight themselves and their weight again, up a 10% grade. And they're also very sure-footed on the track. They, uh, uh, they, the wheels were in smaller rigid units than a standard locomotive, so they're more flexible. On a, on a logging railroad, what they'd do is they'd cut a strip up a hill, run the tra they'd throw the tracks on the ground, holding it together with the, some of the logs they cut, and it'd be pretty rough track, but they'd run up and down the hill until the trees were gone, and then as they started coming down, as they cut the first, whatever, thousand feet, they'd pull up the rail and take it down on a trip, and uh, these were much better at sticking to the rail than, uh, than a conventional locomotive. Um, this was a made, this was a Willamette design, built by the Willamette, uh, I mean, this is the last one anywhere. Um, here's a, this is the same railroad, the same two locomotives. They had saved a couple of, uh, their flat cars, and I'm not sure where they got us the trees, but they had trees loaded up for us. And once again, this was as sunny as it got. We never did see Mount Rainier. Uh, you know, we're jumping down to Prineville, Oregon, down uh, just south of Bend. Uh, the Prineville, the city of Prineville Railroad, it's the only railroad owned by a city in the U.S. It was a branch on the old Burlington Northern, and the railroad decided it wasn't profitable, but the town relied on the rail connection for a lot of jobs, so the city bought it and bought a couple of locomotives for him. Um, one of the fellows involved wanted a steam engine and went out and got this one and restored it. Um, back in the early 2000, uh, relatively inexpensive flash, portable flash, photographic flash units uh, became popular. And it, rail fans, of course, were running out to take pictures at night. So it's become a, a uh, requirement for all of our excursions. We have to get up real early or stay up real late and get out the flashes. Does it have a cow catcher? It's got a little flat pilot. It's, it doesn't have the, the point. At they, wow. they come in all different sorts of styles. Um, a lot of the, the real pointy ones were for moving snow. And the, Oregon isn't known for having snow until I arrived. Um, <laughs> Uh, we did. I did a loop. I drove across Oregon and down through uh, Nevada and then back up the coast. Uh, and uh, while I was trying to get back to Portland to get to the airport, they got 18 inches of snow. And 18, 19, whatever, somewhere in there. And of course, Portland just said we're closed. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I got stuck. I had to waste a couple of days. I wandered through the redwood forest and up and down the coast, and you know, just wasted. But um, then when I, got, when I finally got back to Portland and they were flying planes, I was on Southwest trying to get back to Manchester. Of course, that's through Chicago. 
and the storm had moved to close Chicago. <laughs> so, you know, a day and a half later, Chicago opened up, and the storm was over Manchester. So, <laughs> so yeah, I, I learned to be flexible. Um, yeah, it's a, so this was a, uh, this is another geared locomotive. This is a Shea design. Uh, it was built by uh, Lima, the Lima Locomotive Builders. Um, it's, it's another one built for logging. They didn't have any logs for their uh, cars for us. But um, We're going to jump right along to cover ground. This is the uh, Virginian Truckee out of Virginia City, uh, Nevada. <coughs> uh, around for Don. One of the neat things about going out west is you get entirely different views than you get in New England. There's, this is the same train from where I was just standing. He backed way up, and you can watch him coming forever across the uh, plane. It's kind of neat. Um, once again, we have a tunnel. And the railroad was built to service the silver mines that hit on the Comstock load. And there's still several of the mines. They're not in operation, but they're still there. That mine is why the railroad exists. And then we're going to jump up into, uh, this is McGowan, Oregon, out on the eastern end of Oregon, uh, 40 minutes or so west of Baker City. Uh, uh, we finally got snow. We're getting ready to go. They have two locomotives. They've got a uh, 282, they're narrow gauge. Uh, they've got a 282 and a, uh, uh, and a uh, let me check my notes. It's a... Uh, Uh, it's a Heisler, two truck Heisler. Got here we are, getting ready to go. And we got snow, and we got out on the line and got set up for a nice shot of the train coming at us into the sunrise. I don't remember what that shot looks like, but we had the two trains, and one of them had gone out and gone into the siding, and left the switch line for the siding. So when the uh, other train came back by the they dropped off the conductor and they had to pick him up. So after we got the uh, shot coming at us, um, I turned around and we got shot that I ended up getting was our train stopped to pick up the conductor oh, wow. against the uh, rising yeah. sun. Yeah. And then we had a, this is the same, same setup again a little later in the morning. You got the sunshine out. But that's the Elkhorn Mountains in the background. Wow. We're zipping along. And they have some trees and some hills. Well, let's jump down. We're going to take a look at the uh, Nevada Northern Railway Museum. It's in Ely, Nevada, up in the uh, northwestern, no, excuse me, northeastern part of uh, Nevada. There's absolutely no way you've been to Ely unless you're headed there on purpose. Um, I went from, I stayed in Virginia City the night before, and uh, I got the best GPS directions I've ever gotten. It said, when I punched in the destination as I was leaving my hotel room, it said, turn right on U.S. Route 50. In 346.2 miles, your destination will be on the right. And <laughs> it was true. Um, <laughs> Somebody named Route 50 the world or the country's loneliest highway. It's open rangeland, and uh, the Marines and the Navy have uh, a lot of lot of acreage that they could practice uh, dropping things. And uh, most of the trip, the only uh, traffic I saw were uh, heavy loads of hay headed east, and heavy loads of west, and heavy loads of hay headed west. And I had a day to ponder why they couldn't have made some sort of deal and say, everybody stay home. <laughs> yeah. What a diversity of diet. Right? Yeah. And then we got, um, this was a copper mining railroad. And after World War II, when the price of copper dropped again, the management said, well, it's not profitable to be operating, but the price will come back up. So they paid the crews to take all the equipment indoors and oil it up, grease it up and pack it away so they could return to work in you know, six months, a year. Uh, well, the years went by and copper never came back up to the, to the point where it would be profitable. So the railroad sat 
and the town came up on a sesquicentennial or 150 years, some anniversary, somebody said, hey, it'd be kind of cool if we ran the trains again. So they went and they fixed up one of the steam engines and ran it and had some fun with it. And it went through a variety of organizations trying to run it. And then the, it's a state-backed uh, museum now. Uh, but they are fortunate they have the shops, they have everything they need to run the, the railroad. They got a couple of diesel, you'll see a few diesel sneak in through the, uh, through the presentation, but they're all World War II vintage, so they're, they're appropriate. Um, the railroad bought a couple of diesels before they shut down, but they're still using the steam. They have all the facilities. They've got the coaling tower and the sanding tower and the water tower. Once again, the scenery is a little different than you get here in New England. This is uh, the middle of February, and I was hoping for chest high snow, but you can't win. And here's a, this would have been a, a little small for a typical mining train, but neat country out there running around. You know, we're back in the yard and he's backing in to get some water, looking to see where he's going. Now this was uh, day one of a weekend shoot. Uh, overnight we got some snow, which made us happy. And we're in the yard and they had all the tools. That's a Railway Express Agency truck. Railway Express Agency was the UPS of its day. Uh, they handled what we now call the last mile for delivery. You'd, if you wanted to send a package, you'd take it down to the station in your local town and hand it over to the station master and tell it where to go and they'd figure out how to move it by rail as close as they could and the railway express it. You could either go and pick it up from the station yourself or have the railway express agency deliver it. But these guys managed to keep a railway express agency truck in good, good shape. He brought it out for us. Uh, this was the, uh, uh, Mark Bassett was the director. This is his, his toy. He was the one responsible for restoring it. And, and he came out and he made the mistake. Um, we made him move an awful lot of boxes on and off that box car into the railway express station <laughs> before we were done. They also had a, a working steam crane. Railroads in the steam era, all pretty much had 200 or 250 ton cranes, both to let them work on their equipment and pick up after a wreck, and they're handy for construction. Uh, these guys have one in, still in working condition. Uh, every, they do a steam event every February, two weekends in February every year, and every year or two, they uh, one of the highlights is they work the crane, but not when I was there. There's the crane with its. It's a little tender, you've got different size hooks in case you need them, really big wrenches if you need them. And the passenger car on the right of the screen there would have been a camp car. We're back in the yard at the freight station, and we're just at dusk. Of course, we had to get out the lights. And these are, that's Mark, the director of the museum on the front, and the pilot, and um, I don't know if there's any other management with us, but these are all, the guys that are running the trains are doing it because they love it. Um, the, these guys were being paid, and I, I think I was out there in 2014 or 15, and they were probably getting, you know, 8 or 8.50 an hour. So they, they were driving many hours to come up to work for 8 bucks an hour, not because they wanted the money. <laughs> but we're going to uh, jump a little further east. We're in Colorado. Uh, Denver is up in the upper right there, and as far as Flagstaff, Arizona, this is Williams. We'll go down to the Grand Canyon Railway. We're going to start up here on the Georgetown Loop, and they call it a loop. Uh, underneath the gondola, the second gondola back the, over on the right, the tracks are going underneath that bridge. Railroads uh, with standard side pushing pistons. Three or three and a half percent grade was about all they could handle. There were a couple places where they got up to four percent, but that was a real uh, a real headache for their operations. So one of the ways you can lessen the grade is to make the track longer. And so there are several places 
the tracks will go around the valley and a couple places where they actually go right around and cross back over themselves. So you go further to go raise the same height. That's what they're doing here. Okay. And now I'm now at the track level of the, the above the bridge. And you can see in the background there towards the top, there's part of the same rail line. And this guy's gone around the canyon and he's down below. Um, and then now we're going to jump over to the Durango and Silverton. How many people have ridden the Durango and Silverton? Really? I'm not sure. <laughs> well, that, that's, uh, they were one of the early operators of excursions and they haul something like six million people. So they're, uh, they run out of Durango, Colorado, southwest uh, portion of the state, and Silverton was where the mines were. And they run up. The railroad survived. It was petering out. The mines were petering out in the 60s. And the railroad management wasn't going to invest any money in the railroad. But a, a company wanted to put a gas pipeline through. And the only way to get the materials in was on the railroad. So the railroad survived the better part of a decade hauling materials for the, the pipeline. Um, you now, common carriers are what we call railroads that are in regular operation or will carry freight. Um, I actually saw this as a common carrier railroad. Dad took us across country in 67 and my brother and I spent a very pleasant evening enjoying ourselves sitting on the guardrail in downtown Durango watching them switch cars in the uh, in the yard before we took the trip. But they're famous because they go up the Animus River Gorge. They had to blast a ledge for the tracks. And there are a lot of tight spaces. The railroaders used to joke that they couldn't paint the cars because if they painted them, they'd scrape on the rock. They'd be that much wider. But here they are coming along the Animus Rivers, some 420 feet below. These were taken back in the film days. These are the uh, the daily excursion trains. What were the braking systems like when, when it, they started? Well, the, the, what what are the braking systems like? In, in the early days, there were brake shoes connected to a chain and a wheel on the car, and the engineer to, to have them set the brakes, and the guys in every car would turn the wheel, set the brakes. We'll actually see a see a railroad using those. Um, these days, they've replaced it with air brakes. They, they pump them up to turn them off, to take them off, and the engineer can reuse them. Uh, these are back in the days. Um, I had to hike up into the National Forest up there. They had, uh, I don't remember, I've been out several times. I don't remember if this year they were running three or four trains up and three or four trains back every day. And, but I'd get up there well before they had any trains out on the track and before they were doing any work, so I didn't have to worry about running into trains when I was walking in. Then go up and just sit there and wait for them, and then uh, I took a book and usually tried to take a nap, and I knew when to get up for the uh, afternoon trains coming home because that's when the thunderstorm would hit. And fortunately, it would come through every day and soak me and then move on. But this line... Uh, south of Durango, it dips down into New Mexico and then bounces back and forth in New Mexico, Colorado border several times before going back to the main line in Antonito, Colorado. Um, and down out of Chama, New Mexico, in the northwest corner of New Mexico, uh, there's another organization running equipment left over from the Durango, uh, from the Denver and Rio Grande Western. Um, same sort of thing. Uh, Chama, New Mexico is a neat little town that exists because the railroad had its shops there. Uh, when I was looking to go out there, it took me just a little while to realize that the place you stayed was called the hotel, and the diner was called the diner. <laughs> yeah, they didn't need to distinguish, but uh, it was neat. Uh, I got into town, it was a beautiful July night, and I had the windows open, and you could hear the coyotes yipping up in the hills. Right across the street, there were three steam locomotives simmering away, and every once in a while, they'd pop the pressure gauge, and um, that was a highlight of. But these guys actually go up a four percent grade as they come out of Chama, and so they've got to use at least two 
if not three locomotives, depending on how big the train is. And they go running along. They get up to 10 or 12 miles an hour on a good day. Um, and they go chug it up. I actually had fun out here. Uh, I rented, I was calling it a roller, a Kia roller skate. I picked up a little tiny Kia something at the Denver airport, brand new. I was pulling plastic off the, off the mirrors when I got it. I got out here. It was already 100 degrees when the train left. So I was hopping out and leaving the engine running for the air conditioning. This is back in the days when you put the key in the ignition. And 10 or 12 miles out of Chama, uh, probably 6 or 8 miles from any other human being not on the train, I got out and I kicked the lock with my knee, slammed the door, went across the street, got my photo, waved to everybody on the train, went back and discovered I was oh. locked out of my car. Like, you know, I grew up near Boston, so you know there were lots of barbed wire fences and a little barbed wire was able to uh, get going again. Now here you can see they're working away, they're going uphill. See the smoke going straight up? When a train's moving fast, the smoke appears to fall back over the train. But they're going so slowly that the smoke is going straight up. <laughs> they're working for all they can do, all they can do. When they get up, you can see, this is with a little telephoto, so it's a little exaggerated. But you can see how that track drops off. But this is where they'll drop off the helper engines. And then they run up a little ways along the state highway before disappearing up into the national forest where you can't see them. This is the same morning. This is the last spot before they disappear into the, into the forest. And this is another place where they loop around a canyon for the grade. I, I got up here, and the road was built on a lot of rock riprap. It was 20, 25 feet above the, the open pasture land. Um, closest place I could find to pull off was three quarters of a mile, maybe a mile from where I wanted to be. So I parked and I, I had time. The train was still doing 10 mile an hour. And I walked down and I was standing there waiting. And after a couple of minutes, I looked back up the way I'd come and here came 35 or 40 cattle down the street. <laughs> and all I could think of was my doctor's warning. She had always told me that red meat was going to get me. I didn't <laughs> think she meant on the hoof, but... Um, <laughs> I was looking to see if I could make it down the riprap, and a logging truck showed up and uh, convinced the cows they'd like to go down the riprap, but it was an eventful morning. Um, then coming home, this is the same line coming back, scenery by Warner Brothers. I kept expecting to see the Coyote and Roadrunner. Um, this is uh, one of the few places that I've actually run into a rattlesnake when I'm out. So it was, uh, yeah, I had to fly. But this is... Um, most of the tourist roads used to be this way. It's getting tougher and tougher with insurance liability. Um, it used to be you could go right in and stand next to the guy and talk to him while he was working. Um, actually, uh, this guy, he's cleaning out the fire. There's coal isn't, coal comes with a lot of stuff that doesn't burn. They get a lot, they call them clinkers. And they've got ashes and they have to clean out the fire a couple times a day to keep it going. He's wearing a bowler hat, which is actually uh, historically correct. That's pretty much what the engineers would have worn. The striped hats that everybody likes to think of came along with the early diesels. But uh, yeah, this was the first morning I was here. Uh, they hauled the engines half a mile or so east of the yard to service them. And I walked up when I saw them doing it and chatted with them. And they were very kind and uh, I rode home, rode back down to my car in the engine. It's tougher and tougher to find places that you can get in and touch the equipment and talk to the guys, but that's one of the, was one of the real thrills. Jumping up to the Grand Canyon Railroad. They run a, a commuter train from Williams, Arizona to the south rim of the Grand Canyon. Uh, it's owned by one of the big resort operators. They put a lot of money in. They have two steam locomotives that they ran for a while. They've converted them to burn used vegetable oil that they recycle from restaurants. They smell vaguely like french fries as they go by. Um, running the steam engines proved to be too much trouble, so they bought a couple of just post-World War II vintage diesels, and their business grew so that those diesels weren't quite powerful enough, and they replaced those, but they, uh, they brought those out for us, and we had both steam locomotives. And here, oh, the fireman's got the firebox door open. He's throwing coal on the fire, or getting a cup of coffee. Um, 
Yeah, you can see we got the flames, and we were hoping for a lot of snow again. This was uh, middle of February, and we're up in the high plains, but uh, we didn't get it. But kind of neat countryside. Uh, we were out on the line when their regular passenger train came through. These are the just post World War II diesels that they ran, especially for us that day too, so we could get the uh, the shot. Of course, you got to get two steam locomotives side by side if you've got two. And it is absolutely required that you get them double heading. How many have been to a baseball double header? How many of you knew that the term double header came from two locomotives on the train? And we've all, there's a lot of language. Uh, we've all heard of guys on the fast track or you get sidetracked. Um, uh, even highball, the drink, the early signaling systems, they had a post and they had a rope on a pulley. They had a ball that they'd crank usually up to let you go. And so the engineer and the conductor, when they approached the signal, one of them would yell, uh, they'd confirm that it was a high ball and they could go. And that translated into sing um, and then Harvey was a, oh, he was a Santa Fe engineer. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, um, we're out there. This is a uh, bridge over one of the rivers just north of Williams. Uh, that's a very important structure for several hours a year. It was dry when we were there, but we, uh, we stayed out to get them in the evening. We didn't bring... Uh, I think we just had two little lights for that one. We're going to jump further east again. We're going to go to the center of the country. Um, it's Cincinnati, and we're down here. This is Chattanooga. Then we go down as far as Roanoke. We're going to go up to Strasburg, Pennsylvania, and we'll actually sneak up into very western Connecticut in this this batch. But um, five years ago today, I'm in Chattanooga, Tennessee. They've got two uh, locomotives from the Southern Railway. Um, rail fans would recommend the 4501 and the 630. But we had them put together. And they took us out to the shops in East Tennessee. And um, not sure where the baggage came from. But we just happened to be there. And then we got we brought in some reenactors. Um, the fellow driving the car insisted on looking at all the idiots taking pictures of the train rather than watching the train. <laughs> Um, but, you know, you can't yell at him because he was kind enough to come out with his car. Um, but, uh, once again, we had a tunnel, so we have to do the coming out of the tunnel shot. And we got both the engines working together. And that's the Chickamauga Creek, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. If you... Remember your Civil War history that was contested around uh, uh, Chattanooga. That was. Uh, we're going to go. This is out in Ohio. Um, in uh, I'll remember where when we're done. Um, there was a fellow. He was an orthodontist by trade, but he bought a little short line railroad so he had a place to run his locomotives. Um, this was originally built for the Grand Trunk Western. And we had our own little train of mostly vintage freight cars that we were riding along in. And we'd been out most of the day, and the owner of the railroad showed up and said that the, the railroad they connected to had called and wanted this coal train delivered. He said, do you want to continue with your train, or do you want to see the uh, uh, 6325 on a coal train? So we said coal train. So this is actually in revenue service. He's actually making money for the railroad here. This was kind of a neat trip. Uh, it's run for photographers. There was an older fellow along on the trip that didn't have a camera, but he was getting off and watching, and I wandered over and struck up a conversation with him, and he turned out to have been the locomotive foreman for the Grand Trunk Railroad when these were delivered. And he was the one that, you know, put them together with the, they, they came in without the main rods on them so they could be dragged without being under steam, and he was the one who got them up and taught everybody how to run them, and and he'd just been watching. He hadn't said anything. And I, I uh, took him over and introduced to the railroad, the owner of the railroad and said, you want to talk? And uh, our locomotive foreman went home in the cab. But uh, that was kind of neat. You, 
you, you, I, I've learned that the quiet guys that are just standing off to the sides are usually the ones that have an interesting story. But uh, same railroad. We got a couple of diesels. But again, uh, just post World War II. It did. Uh, this is, was originally a Canadian national, uh, uh, Cana yeah, Canadian national local, uh, no, Canadian Pacific, 1290. Uh, very similar to the ones that Steamtown used to run out of Bellows Falls. Okay, and then we had two of them. They had two tracks for a section of the rain, so we had to have them, had to have them race. And now we're going to jump down to Cass, West Virginia. It's down by Green Bank where they have the radio telescope. Uh, there are a couple of operations now they're just connected but uh, on opposite sides of the hill there there were logging railroads. Um, these have a bunch of the geared locomotives. They've got uh, uh, the biggest Shea ever built, the last Shea ever built, and there's several others but they uh, they go up nasty hills and instead of going looping around the valleys what they do they have switchbacks where you go up a ways and pass a switch and the, somebody throws a switch for you and you back up and they have to do it several times to get up the hill to keep the grade down but uh, they were a logging railroad again um, they have three tracks just outside the station so we get three trains there's actually a third locomotive that's fallen behind in the back he wasn't able to keep pace to give us three aside but they uh, a good show and then uh, we're jumping up to just out outside of Cumberland, Maryland. This is the Maryland Scenic Railroad. Uh, this was a 280 that they had. That um, every 1,492 operating days, you have to take a steam locomotive and strip it down to inspect it and rebuild it. Uh, it's a process that costs something over a million bucks for a modest locomotive. So it's a, an important event to see whether they're going to come back. Uh, the 734 timed out, and we thought the railroad was done with steam, but uh, we'll see in a second that they had a neat, neat answer. Here's, uh, this is Frostburg on the old Western Maryland Railroad. This is as far as they go, but there's a nasty hill coming up from Cumberland up here. They have a turntable up there that they could spin the 734 on. Um, when the 734 timed out and went in to see if she's going to be rebuilt, they got a a monster out of the old Baltimore and Ohio Railroad Museum. This is a 2662 that was built for the Chesapeake and Ohio to lift the coal trains up out of the coal fields. Um, this is the largest regularly operating steam locomotive in the country. Um, you can go down to Cumberland most weekends in season and ride behind her. Uh, big bruiser. And back in the station at night. We're going to jump up to Everett, Pennsylvania, um, out by, um, uh, not quite out to Altoona, um, uh, Holidaysburg was what I was trying to come up with. Here we are getting ready for the day. It's about 4 o'clock in the morning. We're up, uh, we got fortunate that the uh, Holidaysburg station master showed up with his car that morning. It, uh, once again, that stage, we found somebody with a car. And we've got engine leaving Hollidaysburg. Now, there's steam coming off the sides there. Uh, when they sit, water can condense in the cylinder. Steam will compress, but water won't. So when they go to start up, if there's water in the cylinder, if they try to push the cylinder and the piston in, it can blow the end of the cylinder off. I've actually seen a locomotive do it. It's very impressive. And you get something like a big manhole cover flying several yards down the track with a very loud noise. So there's a valve on the bottom of the cylinder that the engineer or fireman can open up and they blow steam out to take the water out of the... Oh, he's blowing. blind for a minute there. Yeah. Has to hope there's nothing in the track. Yeah, he'll find out. And here, the second morning, uh, this was, uh, I, I think Mount Rainier may be back there for all I know. <laughs> but uh, we had another miserable day, so we, uh, we make the best. Then the Strasburg Railroad in Strasburg, Pennsylvania. This is a wonderful place to visit. Uh, the only complaint is that they don't have an awful lot of track. 
uh, they've got eight and a half or nine miles or something, but uh, it's worth a, worth a trip. They've got several steam locomotives. Here, you notice we're starting before dawn. That, uh, we've paid them to run that train early. A uh, little further up the line, we got the guys going to town to catch up with the train. Here they are zipping along. The, uh, that's the fireman riding on the plate between the engine and tender. And that must be a pretty exciting ride. That, that engine's going to be bouncing and shifting side to side. No, notice he's hanging on tightly. Um, and our weather never improved. So this is, the, this is the next morning. This is the view we had in the yard. Uh, I'm not sure who on the truck. Uh, these are a couple of the rivers. They had a nice chat for us. And the day just got worse and worse. It was a torrential downpour, so we uh, retreated. We had them pull the engine into the shop and made the po crews pose for us. And steam locomotives had to be oiled regularly. Um, depending on what line you were on, you might have to stop for water every 20 miles, uh, maybe a little further. And they'd go around and oil all the joints on the wheels. And in World War II, Rosie didn't just rivet. Uh, railroads employed a lot of ladies in, in the, the clerical jobs and in yard jobs. And, uh, this young lady volunteered to come out and be an engine wiper for a day. She, she was quick, though. We tried to get her into character by smearing grease across her face, but she, uh, she could outrun us. <laughs> <laughs> And then uh, while we were out there with our reenactors, this fellow who actually works for the railroad day in and day out came wandering by, and I thought he was an interesting looking fellow. Well, he got his picture. Um, yeah, this is in the, uh, well into the 1960s, uh, trains were guided by hand signals. And even still today, it's, it's very common to see a crew switching giving hand signals. But this is guy riding the, the back end of the train as it backs up and he's telling the locomotive to keep coming. And uh, at the end of the day we were going to take a break and then set a stage for a night shot and as I was going to get in the car to go get some dinner mm. I found this in the station and wondered why we'd wasted the rest of the day. <laughs> uh, and the, the Reading and Northern Railroad out of Hamburg, Pennsylvania now has two steam locomotives restored. Uh, the 425, of course, is known as the four and a quarter. Uh, this is a Pacific, which would have been a common, the, the 462, the 462 um, would have been a common passenger locomotive for modest trains. Uh, the Boston and Maine owned a fleet of them. Uh, it was common area, but it, it's got fairly large wheels, so it's designed to move. Um, while we were out in this field, they had a long straight section of track, and the uh, two railroad managers we had uh, managed to spend a lot of time with their back to the track when the uh, train rode by for us. <laughs> they were uh, ignoring the speed limit with, uh, by a great deal. Um, here we are in Jim Thorpe, Pennsylvania at the end of the evening. This was a miserable night. It was going back and forth between rain and sleet and snow, um, but we had some nice scenery. and. There was only one family out about town. They were curious what we were up to, so they wandered over to see why we had all the lights and what the engine was doing. So of course we made a pose. And, uh, now we're going to jump up to the Connecticut Antique Machinery Association in Kent, Connecticut, uh, almost on the New York line, uh, southern Connecticut. Uh, they have one little steam locomotive they rescued from a sugar plantation in Hawaii. It's a little out of place, but it's a steam engine, uh, so we're happy to see it. And then it's a, the oddest place. They have a whole roundhouse full of steam engines without wheels. Steam power was used for an awful lot of things, not just locomotion, but anywhere that you had a mill that ran on water power, you could replace it with steam power. Uh, so steam locomotives for uh, turning shafts were very, very common, and they've got a collection of them. Uh, that they've all restored the, all these, and they work. Uh, they, twice a year they do uh, open houses where everything that they can fire up 
and run will run. It's a neat visit. It's not that far. Let's take another look at the East Broadtop Railroad. Uh, Broadtop was a, one of the mountains down there that had a lot of coal. And they're the East Broadtop because they ran on the east side. The Everett Railroad that we saw ran from the west side of the mountain. Um, this ran into the 1950s, 1956. And it just, the coal business petered out. This was a narrow gauge line that connected to the Pennsylvania main line in uh, Union, Pennsylvania. But uh, as the business dwindled, they gave up. It just wasn't profitable, so they walked away. Being a uh, narrow gauge short line, they had all their shops to make everything that they ran, and they just closed the shops and walked away. And eventually it was sold to a scrapper. And it sat for many years without getting scrapped for whatever reason. And then they, uh, they came up on a, I don't know if it was a bicentennial, 150 or 200 year anniversary in town. And somebody said, hey, we need if the train ran again. So they got one of the engines fired up and went back and forth on the line. Had enough fun doing it that they did it a couple more times. And then uh, for a couple of decades it went through a series of different organizations trying to run it. And none of them could quite cover the expenses to operate, let alone do the maintenance on it. And so they'd run it a couple of years and give up. And it got to be a joke in the rail fan community about uh, how many times you've been to the very last run of the East Broadtop Railroad? Uh, I think I made it to eight. Um, but it um, it sat from 2011, and then in 2021, a uh, trio of retired railroad managers with some money <coughs> bought it and have started getting some grant, and they're bringing it back to life. And it, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing to watch. Um, we'll, we'll take a longer look at it here. Here's uh, one of their engines in the... Orbisonia, Pennsylvania. This is an hour or so west of Carlisle. Um, they had their own delivery truck instead of the Railway Express. Um, the fellow in the uh, plaid shirt owns the bed and breakfast across the street and is a conductor on the road because he knows that's the way to fill the bed and breakfast. <laughs> and the guy in the tan jacket was a shop owner in town. I don't remember which shop, but um, they, they knew how to attract tourists to town. This one goes way back. This is before the uh, railroad shut down what we thought for good. Um, same with this. But that's one of their, uh, I guess that's their car building shop. And they have, they have all the gear to build stuff. We'll see inside the shop in a minute. But here's, here we are out in the yard with a, this would have been a pretty typical train. They'd have a box car for what they call less than car load. It was individual packages if you wanted to send a crate or something. You didn't have to have a whole car, you, they put it in there and moved. Uh, then the coal, which paid for the train, and then the passenger's car in the back would carry uh, anybody that happened to need to go between Orbisoni and, and Grove or uh, um, The locomotives on the left, actually on the right, on, uh, the one on the left is working and actually fired. One's on the left have been out of service for several decades with a uh, cracked boiler. But you notice we've got them smoking. You know, we've got them fired up. They look like they're working. We brought some theatrical smoke bombs. And yeah, this is a, one of the conductors sending our smoke bomb for us. Uh, we miscalculated on the size of the smoke bomb we needed. <laughs> but we got shots with the, the engine appearing to be under steam. Yeah, and then uh, here they are. They're taking water in the yard. Here's our bed and breakfast owner. Uh, it's a neat bed and breakfast, too, if you go down. It's a great place to stay. Um, but they're working in around the yard buildings. When I took this one, the railroad had been sitting uh, for eight or nine years, and it looked like it was, it was done. Uh, there was a small group of volunteers that was determined to keep the, as much history as I could, but it, I called this one waiting for the call. And it actually, uh, I didn't think we'd ever see it get called for another train, but it has been. Um, that was kind of, this is the inside of their shops. This is obviously before anybody heard of OSHA. The, all the machine tools are driven by leather belts or chains 
connected to a shaft overhead. There's a boiler in the back, a steam boiler in the back that generates steam to turn the shafts overhead. And uh, uh, it's all intact. They have everything they need to machine uh, cars from the rail up. Uh, I learned this last time out that the boiler in the back was made by the same outfit that made the Titanic's boilers. And it wasn't until the new management came in on the East Broadtop that they realized, they thought they didn't think any of their boilers still existed. But they discovered that there was a pair in the back of the shop, and they showed up and had volunteered to restore them for the East Broadtop, which I thought was kind of neat. This was the most photographed calendar on a railroad probably in the world. This was on one of the machine benches in the in the workshop, just thrown there when the guys got laid off and abandoned. But they, uh, what is it? What year? July what? 9, 1954. 1954. Yep. That's a boiler? Is that what that well, that's a... Uh, uh, that's an engine. That's, yeah, it looks like a generator of... Yeah. That, uh, they, the roundhouse was built before they had electricity. They added it, you can see the light, but they had big windows so they could see what they were doing. And they've got all the equipment, all the tools. If you need to adjust your watch, they have a wrench for it. Uh, and I, I like looking at it and trying to figure out, you know, they, they've got all sorts of strange bends and twists. And you know that's because there's a bolt on the third wheel of the engine and the back of the running gear that they had to design a tool to get to. But they, uh, they made them. And, yeah, and uh, the smithy was inside the workshop with the rest of the guys with a little vent to go outside, and he just dropped his tools and walked out. But uh, when the new management came in in 2001, they started right in, and I made it down there this last October. They've already stabilized a lot of the shop buildings. They've uh, fixed up the track north of the station. Um, and for the first time in its career, they actually put ballast. They actually put rock ballast down in the in the steam locomotive days that lived on the tracks lived on the cinders that they dropped. Um, and they're working to clear tracks to the south. It's going to be a phenomenal thing when they get it running. But we are out. We got a morning without a lot of sunshine. We make the best of it. And we got fall colors weren't. Quite as nice as I hoped, but I'm sure pretty seen. And we had a couple of reenactors. Yeah, they uh, stopped to greet the train. And then, uh, how many of you have heard of O. Winston Link? He did the black and white steam photographs on the Norfolk and Western in the '60s. Um, he was a commercial photographer from New York State, from New York City, uh, that knew that steam locomotives were going away. The Norfolk and Western ran. They were about the last uh, mainline steam operators in the country. And Link talked to management and got the run of the place. And he was famous for setting up, uh, this had something like 40 flash bulbs back in the days of the big flash bulbs, like a, like a light bulb. Um, and it's a drive in. He uh, actually did some photos, there's some darkroom magic to add the jet to the, the screen. But the train and the cars were photographed. Um, so when we were down at the East Broad Top in October, the charter organi organizer was Pete Laro, uh, the fellow out of, the, and uh, yeah, Pete is a great photographer and he's ambitious, and he wanted to recreate the shot, but we had a problem. The nearest drive-in was about 45 miles away. That didn't stop Pete. <laughs> we, he built a drive-in screen for us. <laughs> So this is, uh, and that, we, we actually projected the plane for this. There's no photoshopping in that one. But I thought that was a fun, uh, uh, I give, but, uh, we're going to jump up uh, New York and, Port Jervis. yeah, Port Jervis, and uh, down into New York. Um, in the, this was one of the first mainline steam locomotives I saw. Um, in the early 1980s, a fellow had the idea, this was, uh, when oil prices skyrocketed. Uh, he wanted to see if he could build a steam turbine engine rather than driving directly with pistons. He wanted to drive a turbine to make electricity and then have uh, electric motors like a diesel. 
So he rebuilt this. Remember, these were all built before there were any computers. They were built you know, with slide <laughs> rules and uh, the parts were machined with calipers. And um, So in the 1980s, we finally had computers small enough to go on a locomotive. And so they had a variety of sensors where they could actually measure what forces were being produced. And he was running coal trains from uh, Hinton to Huntington, West Virginia. And I went down in a cold February to watch them. Uh, and it was one of the first times I got a clue as to how powerful a steam locomotive was. The engine was too heavy to go across a bridge to get into the yard. So they had three of their brand new 3,000 horsepower diesels that they sent down to grab their train. And the diesels went down in the yard and spit a lot of sand on the rail and pulled and made a lot of noise and came creeping up to the train. And I thought we were in for a show. And this guy backed down on the train and coupled up and they tested their brakes and they gave two toots to say he was going forward. The engineer opened the throttle and the train just disappeared. <laughs> um, yeah, we didn't get many shots that day. We learned the hard way. Uh, it came up to... They ran it from Hoboken, New Jersey, up to Port Jervis uh, several times in the uh, uh, early 2000s. And here they are. Uh, the little thing in front of it is the New York Susquehanna and Western. It's a little Chinese-built 282. In World War II, the Federal Railroad Administration gave the Chinese plans to build the standard U.S. locomotives, and the Chinese went to town. Um, and they survived um, into the 2000, early 2000s. One of the, the big killer on the American railroads was the cost of labor. China didn't worry about the cost of labor. Um, so they were still running. There's, they built them into the late 1980s. Um, I actually went over in uh, 2005 to watch uh, the last all-steam mainline railroad operation in the world. But, um, a couple of American companies imported uh, mostly the smaller Chinese railroads. A couple of them got the, the larger one. But uh, the, uh, the Knoxville and Kane out in western Pennsylvania had one that it moved up to the Essex Railroad in Connecticut. And the guy that owned the New York Susquehanna and Western was a rail fan through and through. And he, he had seen it, and he decided he wanted one. <laughs> so he ordered one from China, number 141. They built it for him, and they put it on a freighter. Which sank. Yeah, which sank in the Bay of Bengal on the way. And so he didn't know what to do. But then the Valley Rare said, oh, yeah, you can buy ours. So he couldn't number 141 because they had a 141. It was just underwater. So this became the 142. And um, I misspent a lot of my graduate school days playing on the Susquehanna. This was back in the day when rail fans were tolerated. You could climb on the engine and talk with the crew and go for rides. And I've actually helped re-rail this. They uh, knocked into one of the tender trucks off on a farmer's crossing one night had to run the next morning so I was under it shoving blocking around for the guys. Uh, this is the Tehannock Viaduct in Pennsylvania just north of Scranton. I always, well, there were a couple of the really big viaducts in Pennsylvania. I always wondered when the surveyors were showing the investors the proposed route you know, they'd be out there standing on the hill, and they say, okay, you know, we're going to come up along there, and we're going to swing out a little bit to lower the grade. Then we're going to come up, jump a bridge on that hill. And, <laughs> and um, you're going to what? Build a bridge. <laughs> uh, but they did. Um, so the other couple of, this was a trip from, that was a trip from uh, Scranton up to Syracuse for the National Railroad Historical Association. This is the 142 again. We're down in, uh, that's uh, Charlottesville Reservoir in New Jersey. Uh, here he is up in Remsen, New York. This moved around a fair bit in New England. Uh, it actually came to Bellows Falls at one point. Uh, that's just upside out of Remsen. Here it is in Cortland. That's uh, engineer Joe Dillon, who was out oiling it up. Uh, Joe's been retired six or eight years now. We stay in touch. Uh, here he is in Bellows Falls in uh, who remembers, 97, 97-ish. Uh, it came up in the Green Mountain Railroad, used it between Bellows Falls and Chester a couple times every day. So here we are leaving Bellows Falls. We got up to Chester. There's the next generation of steam locomotive photographers. I, I did not plant him. He was natural. <laughs> a little red spider. And then we're going to jump up to New England here. We're going to 
um, the Basumsic Railroad up in uh, Barnet. And then we're going to go over to, uh, we've got Clark's Trading Post, J.E. Henry is Loon Mountain's little railroad. Conway Scenic Railroad's got one. Main narrow gauge is on the waterfront in Portland. And then the Wiscasset Waterville in Farmington up in Alma, Maine. But here we are in, in uh, Barnet. Yeah, this is a little Heisler, I think geared, one of the geared locomotives. This lived in a uh, quarry out in Missouri before they got it and resurrected it. Uh, for many years they'd run it a couple weekends before Christmas. Uh, Dr. Kendall is the owner and he's gotten on and his kids aren't in a position where they can run it, but we're hopeful that it's going to come back. But, uh, the first day I went up to see it, they actually uh, they have a, an antique caboose. They managed to derail the caboose while they were getting set up. And so they, they were making everybody ride in the steam engine. And there were three ladies that were well into their 70s, if not beyond. And they were having the time of their, I was riding with them, they were having the time of their lives, and all, the whole lives they wanted to ride a steam locomotive, but they finally gotten the chance. We've jumped over to uh, Clark's Trading Post. They have half a dozen engines, I'm not sure which ones are actually running now. Um, but they, in the fall, they have a weekend where they fire up everything that can steam, uh, locomotives, their, their steam steamroller, and all sorts of gizmos. This is kind of neat, if you look directly above the fire plug there, you see a pole between the car and the engine. Back in ancient history, they used to move cars around by putting a pole on the engine and just holding it in place by pushing it against the car. This was handy if you needed to move a car on the adjacent track. You could run it at an angle and push the car without having to get on the track. The downside of this, of course, is every once in a while one of these things is going to break. And it's under a lot of pressure, so it's going to go spitting out uh, with enough force to kill whoever happens to be in the way. Um, so they decided this probably wasn't a good idea. But the, uh, um, the White Mountain Central is what Clark calls their railroad. They do it for a couple demonstration trains when they've got stuff running. They've got a, a, a covered bridge. And their locomotives are always pushing stuff. This was pretty typical on logging railroads. The locomotive would be on the downhill side. The locomotive had brakes and the cars didn't. So you could stop the locomotive, which would stop the cars above it. If the cars were below it and they got away, they'd roll. So uh, they'd push up the hill and back down the hill. Here's a view from the car. With a, This is another pole. They we're demonstrating how it... The red pockets on either side of the pilot there... Those are the ones that they'd use if they were trying to push a car on the adjacent track. Um, and here's, this is Loon Mountain. This is an actual operating steam locomotive. It, I don't think it, who knows how long the track is. It's really half a mile. It goes from the parking lot to the base of the hill and back. <laughs> and then, of course, the Cog Railway. Notice the slant to the boiler. Okay. That will be level on the steepest part of the track. They have to point the front of it down because if they had a standard boiler, as they went up the hill, all the hot water would run into the cab and upset the crew. And working their way up the hill. Uh, last I knew, they were still running the first trip every morning with steam and then the rest are their biodiesels. And the Conway Scenic has a old Grand Trunk Western. Uh, 060, a little switch engine that they would have used in a yard or industrial parks. Um, you know, they run it. They run it the first weekend of January most years. They run up to Notchland. And there it is by the Notchland Inn. And coming through Bartlett. And she can get moving right along. Uh, jumping up to the main narrow gauge museum on the waterfront in Portland, Maine. Uh, it's another two foot gauge and the rails are laid on the old Grand Trunk Western standard gauge mainline. Notice how wide the ties are for how wide the rails are. Uh, this is a neat, uh, if you've got grandkids, they do all sorts of Easter trains and Halloween trains and uh, Santa Express. Uh, they do a great job. It's not very far so if you have really tiny kids they aren't going to get bored. 
Um, but yeah, it's a neat place to visit. Uh, here they are. That is the Atlantic Ocean in the background, so we have gone coast to coast. Um, this gives you an idea of just how narrow they are. This is with a very long lens. but um, They're very small locomotives. Tracks are very narrow. And the crew is usually uncomfortable in the cab, so they spend a lot of time halfway out, often sitting on the windowsill. Um, here was our conductor for the day. Our engineer. And we're going to finish up here in the Wisconsin Waterville in Farmington. This is, they're rebuilding the uh, railroad. It's in Alma, Maine. Um, we've got Bath and Wiscasset, uh, just up Route 1. This is another absolutely magical place to go. These guys are fanatical. They want to do everything as it was done in 1900-ish. Okay. No radios. Um, somebody was asking about brakes. We'll see in a minute how they're seeing. Um, it's two-foot gauge, but they, uh, they go zipping along. This, these would have been mixed trains that have had some freight up on the front, probably some log cars and then a uh, passenger car on the back. And that would have been a fairly typical train for them. Uh, we got lucky when we got to on the center. There was a fellow waiting to cross. And uh, on the center is a flag stop. There were a lot of small town stations that the train wasn't scheduled to stop but it would if somebody wanted to get on or off. So if you wanted to get on, you went down and talked to the station master and he hung out the red, red flag and he's out signaling the train to stop as well. Um, when they stopped, this was the president of the museum at the time, um, they had to take the milk, ca milk cans off the, off the train and sort them. And we learned watching them move the milk cans around. The next time we do this shot, we're going to fill the cans. <laughs> they didn't look like they were working hard enough. <laughs> but they had a, a couple hundred yards uh, to a half mile of track or so every year, depending on what the terrain is. And they're working slowly and steadily north. Uh, this was the end of the line when I was there. Um, we had a couple of trains working again. And here, there's a little grade coming out of Auto Center, coming north. Uh, this is Bill our engineer, and when the engines are making a lot of noise and spitting a lot of steam, it can be very hard to judge how fast you're going looking straight ahead. So they look out the window and look down to see how fast the ground is going by him on the side. And Bill's checking to make sure he's actually moving as he goes uphill. Uh, but it was a nice cold day and we're getting lots of steam in here. Uh, Bill is the engineer. You can see the fellow in the last car watching. Make sure he doesn't miss the hand signal to set the brakes or, or whatever other signal comes down. And here they are. Every car is a brakeman. And here they are passing the signal from the engine. Uh, they, were, they were telling the engineer to back up. And so everybody would repeat the signal so the guy next to him could see it. The uh, railroad uh, ran on into the 1930s and business was fading fast. Uh, they were borrowing money left and right. They got down to one operating steam locomotive. And one day in the winter of 1932, I believe it was, locomotive derailed, flipped over in the ditch. And the management came out and looked at it and said, we're done. And that was the end of the railroad. One of the companies they owed money to was the Benjamin Moore Paint Company that had a lien on the rails. And the uh, paint company wanted to get paid for all their, well, for the loan, so they wanted to recover the rails and resell them. And normally you'd send a train with some flat cars. You'd back the flat cars out to the end of the line and put, pick up the rails, put them on, and pull the flat car ahead of rail length and pick up the rail. They didn't have a locomotive. So they had to get some horses in to pull the flat cars. And the last day I was up there, these guys needed to put a culvert under the tracks. Now, you would expect the museum would just wait for everybody to go home take the backhoe down the line, pull the rails, set them aside, dig the ditch, and put it back with the backhoe, but not these guys. They insist on doing everything by hand. <laughs> they hired a couple of horses, and, brought a, and then there they are lifting up a rail. I, I give them credit. They, uh, 
they really work it. But um, it is a, it's another phenomenal place to visit. They do a variety of things to entertain kids as well. Um, a couple weekends before Christmas, they do a Victorian Christmas where everybody on the railroad and reenactors come in dressed in Victorian uh, outfits, and it's a great time. They have uh, sleigh rides up along the line and all sorts of things to entertain kids. Uh, really worth a visit. And then, uh, you know, here are the, uh, the conductors talking to our accidents. And one of the foremen, I guess, talking to our engine crew. And it's nice. Uh, look at the age of these guys. We've got a lot of young guys involved up there, so the railroad's going to be around a while. Um, I was born uh, two weeks after the last mainline steam run in America. So anybody my age isn't going to be around to run these for long. Um, so it's great to see kids up there. But that's, uh, that's our fireman in the cab. There's not an awful lot of room to spare. Uh, this was the president of the museum. Uh, he was out directing traffic for us in period garb. This is Engineer Bill. Bill's a big guy. He's my size. Look how tiny the locomotive is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, uh, and they're another. They've got a lot of machine tools, and they're grabbing machine tools anywhere they can find them and working on it. And I don't remember what we were making this guy turn. He was cutting something for us. Um, now, on branch lines, at the end of the branch line, it, it's difficult to back up a steam locomotive for any distance. So the, every branch line had a turntable at the end of it, and they had a variety. In the early days, they had uh, steam, little steam-driven, uh, you know, uh, engines to turn the gears around the outside of it. So you coupled up your brake line to the steam engine and opened up the valve and the turntable would spin for you. And then they tried electric motors, but a lot of them at the end of branch lines, the train crew had to push them. And of course, the railroaders would call these Armstrong turntables. Didn't they do that in Woodstock? Uh, I suspect, yeah, I suspect that was long before they had a... Blow the whistle, I heard, and then anybody who was available would help. Yep. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, these guys are turning the engine for us. Here an engineer, engineer again. Uh, this is after a long day. We go out and we drive the train crews nuts. We make them back up and come forward, this time with more steam. Back up, this time come ahead without your headlight. This time come ahead and blow your whistle. And so all day, we're back in the station and we're all getting our gear off the train. And Bill had time to light his pipe and have a moment's relaxation. And this was just a grab shot on the way out of town, but I think my favorite of the day. Yeah, and then uh, we've come to the end of the train here. So we're, um, that's how you can find me. But, uh, oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.